Just as we've been singing, and just as you have heard, open up your Bibles. Hebrews chapter 5. Let's listen to God's Word this morning. Hebrews 5, 11 will be where we start. Give everybody just a moment to get there. Even with the technology that surrounds us, and I, of course, have a Bible app on my phone, it's, it's good to hear God's Word manually being turned through. Hebrews 5, 11. Let me ask you if you're able to join with me in standing in honor of reading God's Word. I'll give the background, so don't worry. The author says, we have much to say about this, what was being talked about. But it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. We pray God's word blesses us this morning. You may be seated. And so let me ask you a question. If you saw it on social media last night, you knew it was coming. Do you want milk or meat? Milk? Okay. I enjoy milk. It's good. But let me ask you, in light of this passage of scripture, (laughs) do you want milk or meat? I mean, context matters, it does, it does. If you were hungry, if you were very hungry, would you prefer milk or meat to fill yourself? Meat, okay, good, good. We get what's going on here. Well, there's a lot happening before here. The focus is that Jesus is supreme and sufficient to demonstrate and bestow God's grace, okay? And so there is a focus here of how Jesus is the great high priest. There is a focus given here of how Jesus exceeds all expectations and prerequisites, if you will, of the high priest's function. There was a time in history where God used high priests. They used an order of people, those called and who had these certain qualifications to present God's grace to bestow God's blessings in certain ways and now it is to be understood that Jesus fully and supremely establishes himself as the great high priest there is extensive understanding here that Jesus actually exceeds all expectations of the high priests and Jesus is the supreme and sufficient way for God's grace to be given and demonstrated and so the author of Hebrews is going through this And disclosing this, it's really a lengthy sermon, if you will. And so at this point in the message, at this point in the sermon here, there's a a stop. The discourse halts for a moment because the author is aware that certain believers, some people, are stopping at the elementary truths of the faith. There are some that would prefer to drink milk instead of eat meat. There are some who would prefer to remain in first grade even as adults. And so let me ask, what if this was math class? Go back to your math days. Whatever class was your favorite math class? Some of you may say, I didn't have a favorite math class. I didn't enjoy it. But go back to math class and picture what that is. Remember some of the most elementary foundational tools you were given in math. What's the go-to way to understand the most basic understanding of math? Two plus two equals four, right? Now, what if we were teaching that here and we established how you have two, you add two, you now have four, right? And you understood that. That concept can be easily understood, certainly. Now, what if we came back again tomorrow, the next week, and the week after that, the month after that, and remained at two plus two equals four? At some point, surely you would say, I got it, right? Okay, two plus two 
equals 4. Got it. Next, right? Would you stop at that, or would you realize that is a foundation being set for what is to come? Right? At some point, you would surely say, okay, we've, we've dissected 2 plus 2 enough. Uh, 2 is 1 and 1, and another 2 is another 1 and 1, and all right, I can do those four ones. There's four. Okay, I got that, and I've established how that equals four. I, I can even do little groups, right? Maybe, maybe three little apples over here and an apple over here, and you put those together. That's four, right? How many different ways can we group four together to show this plus this equals four? We got it, right? We got it. But how many of us in our Christian walk, and this is what the author is getting at here, just revel in 2 plus 2 equals 4? I got that. But I need to, I need to study it some more. I, I need to read about it some more. I need to learn some more. Hang on. Let me write that down again. 2 plus 2 equals 4. You look at the pages before that. They all say 2 plus 2 equals 4. You would think by now you got it, right? That's what's happening here. The author is... is saying, listen, you, you understand the basic truths of the faith. You understand about God's grace, about God's mercy. You understand how faith in Jesus Christ works. You understand how he demonstrated grace, that all who believe in him will be saved. We understand the good news. We understand that Jesus died on the cross. We're in the Lenten season right now. We understand how God's mercy and God's grace works through Jesus Christ. We understand that when we profess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is who he says he is, we will be saved. That when we believe that God raised him from the dead after dying on the cross, after living a perfect life, we, we will be saved. We, but for some people, we tend to stop at that moment. We, we say, I've got that truth. That truth is not the stopgap moment. That truth is the foundation to move forward and to grow. Once the foundation is set, do you stop building? No. You continue to grow. You continue to mature. You continue to push forward, right? And so the author here is saying, listen, at this stage, some of you should be teaching, but you're acting as if you still need to be taught. You're saying you need milk, not solid food. How many of us are saying, give me the milk cup instead of the fork and knife? I mean, let's just be really honest. Some of us have been ingrained with God's good news through Jesus Christ for decades. And they are teaching these truths to others. They are pouring themselves into peers, into young ones, and they are discipling with the knowledge and maturity they have so others can believe and understand and grow and mature as well. That's the way it should be. It's beautiful. That's, the, that's the, the foundation of how we grow as disciples and pass that on, right? But there's always some, always somebody that would say, I would prefer milk. I'm good. Give me the baby bottle. Doesn't make any sense, right? How many of you would go back to first grade right now if you could? Would anybody say, yeah, sign me up. I can't wait. I'd, I'd love to sit amongst the six and seven-year-olds and learn everything they're learning. It wouldn't make any sense, right? But how many of us in our Christian walk say, give me the foundation again. Now, the good news needs to be proclaimed. It needs to be preached. It, it needs to be adhered to, certainly. But how many of us say, that's, uh, that's all I need. I'm good with that. In other words, there are some of us who have stopped maturing in our faith. This is nothing new. I, I'm not proclaiming something new. This is, this is not proof texting here. This has been happening from the beginning when it was to be understood how to grow in your faith with Jesus Christ. And some people said, I I'm good with the basics. I'm good with the two plus two formulas. And that's all I want. And what's, what's being said here and, and what needs to be said here is, if you really understand the good news, if you truly believe the good news, and it's not just a regurgitation of information, then you continue to mature in Christ. And you yearn for the opportunities to mature in your faith and practice what it means to mature in your faith. You desire it. You crave it. You are pulled toward it as the Holy Spirit moves you. Your relationships deepen. Your participation as the church, participating with the mission and ministry of the church, it grows and your awareness strengthens and broadens as to how God is on the move. 
It actually takes more effort, once you accept the good news, to maintain the elementary status of saying milk is enough than to grow freely with Christ. Think about it. Think about how much energy you would have to spend to stay right where you are in your stage in life. If you were naive enough to believe that you could just stay exactly where you are, and everything that I'm currently experiencing now could be experienced just like this for the duration of my life, how much time and energy you would spend in trying to make that happen. I want my relationships to be the exact same. I want my experiences with life to be the exact same. I want the way my body feels when I wake up in the morning to be the exact same, right? And we realize that's just not the way it works, right? It just doesn't happen that way. When we act as if we can hit a stage in life and hit the pause button and say, from here on out, this is how it's going to be. We're, we're fooling ourselves, and we're really just saying, I just want to keep being told 2 plus 2 equals 4. And so this pause that the author of Hebrews hits is to disclose you're not getting it if you're trying to maintain the infancy stage of faith. How many of you maybe remember, or at least heard, several Wednesdays ago, we had a passage of Scripture in Philippians. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. You'll remember this conversation. I heard this phrase used a long time ago, and it's, it just stuck with me. I find it very powerful as to what it means to have a holy imagination. A holy imagination. That really signifies what it means to be mature in our faith. And so we went through Philippians chapter 3. We started at verse 17. And Paul says, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. He has the maturity to say that. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And we had this passage of Scripture move us into conversation as to what it means to have a holy imagination to have our hearts and minds set on heavenly things, to have a heavenly perspective throughout life. So our relationships and priorities are all defined by our heavenly perspective of what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, right? That's how you mature in your faith. That's how you embrace what it means to be standing on the foundation that is the good news so you can practice what it means to actually follow Jesus in real time. I think by and large, we, we get hung up on the good news being enough as if that's the finish line. Now, the good news is sufficient. It's life-giving. It is what we're proclaiming as we move towards Easter. But let me set the record straight. The good news is the starting line. As we proclaim Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior and we profess that truth and our faith in him, we have now begun our new life in him. And so we have to be aware of our context. We have to be aware of what Jesus has done and what he is doing. This is what the author of Hebrews is saying. Be aware of what Jesus did do and be aware of what Jesus is currently doing through you. Are you aware of what Jesus has done and what he is currently doing through you? Or did you believe that once you profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you could just breathe this sigh of relief and say, done. When really, that is the moment when you are fully embracing what it is Jesus is doing through you as Lord and Savior, and now you are going to experience what it means for him to be that in your life in real time. Context is everything. Are you aware of the context around you, of how God is moving through you? The, the author of Hebrews here was aware of the context, was aware of what it means to grow in Christ and build one's faith. 
He could have just continued to plow the, the hard theological ground of really making sure people understood mentally what was happening here and who Jesus was, but this author had to stop and say, wait a minute, so, some of you, make sure you realize, some of you are saying that you just want the elementary truths of faith, and that's just not getting it. You're not aware of your context. Lauren and I were talking on our travels these past few days, and I didn't know how this example might come up, but I think it's appropriate now in discussing context and awareness of how we build our foundation up and mature in Christ. But first, context and how important it is to be aware of one's context. We like to, if we're away for a little period of time with our family, get a dessert at night, right? Everybody likes to get a, a dessert, a treat of some sort, right? Kind of relax the last part of the day with that. So we were looking for places online that a neat restaurant or somewhere that might serve some of the uh, unique dessert item. And we came upon something that's similar to uh, Winston-Salem, a place called Burger Batch. Anybody been there? And they sell these sundaes that are insane. These ice cream sundaes with like a slice of cake on top, like no joke, right? And, or cotton candy sticking out the side this deep. It's crazy. And I thought about I mean, really, it looks really good. We saw this online, and we didn't go to that, but we said that would look really good, right? I mean, one of them is this giant sundae with a cupcake and uh, some ice cream cone sticking out the side, something wild in this huge mason jar or something like that. And we're like, you go to that restaurant, there's people all around you ordering this. It's normal in that context. People are like, oh, look at that. That's so great. I, I want to order one. I'll, I'll pay more money than I should for what it is, and I, I just want to experience that, right? Now, what if, what if you take yourself out of that context? What if you're at home, and at home you decide to get all those things, and you make this giant sundae, and you stick a cupcake on top and an ice cream on the side, and cotton candy flowing out the side, and you sit down, and your spouse comes in, or child, and they probably look at you a little funny, like, what are you doing? What's, what's with this elaborate, enormous dessert that you've made? And now you're eating it by yourself, right? In, in context at home, you, you probably might be looked at a little weird, I'm sure if I was sitting in our living room and Lauren turned the corner and looked and saw me with this giant dessert, she'd be like, what are you doing? Does it make sense in context at home? It's okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, go for it. But kind of odd, kind of weird in context. I've said before when our girls like to go to Sweet Frogs, you can put all sorts of stuff. I know I'm on a whole dessert thing here. All sorts of stuff on your fro frozen yogurt, right? Now, if you were to go home and start putting fruity pebbles and gummy worms and all this stuff in your bowl, your family members might look at you a little odd, like, what are you doing? But in context, there with other people who are like-minded, it's, you're good. It makes sense. It's expected, right? And so I'll reference that for us to understand our context and what's expected of us. What's expected of us is to continue to mature in our faith. What's expected of us is to realize the context of our relationships and that in context we we have to have an awareness that shows us how to practice our faith it's a fish out of water when a long-standing believer doesn't get the elementary truths of the faith and practice them that's as weird as somebody putting gummy worms on their ice cream at home that doesn't make sense in that context and so when a long-standing believer wants to continue to say, teach me two plus two, it doesn't make any sense. That means that you really haven't believed what it is you say you're believing. You want it easy. And that's not the way of the cross. That's not the way of Christ. This whole entire year, we are focusing on what it means to have worship be our foundation and expression of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And how we worship God, it grows our relationship with God and defines all other priorities in our life. And so if we come with a preconceived notion, a set of expectations of exactly how it should be, we're not worshiping. We're trying to control our environment, and that is not following Jesus, right? And so if we go about our day and become aware of our relationships and our context, and demand that it be done the way we want it to be done, and demand that we can just proclaim the elementary truths of faith instead of diving deeper and coming out of the shallows, then we're trying to control our environment. 
and we're not really following Jesus Christ. If we proclaim that we follow Jesus Christ, we fully embrace and obey what he brings to our attention in real time, in our context, and we mature and grow along the way. So how many of you are ready to get out of the shallow end? To stop writing down two plus two. To stop expecting what you've previously experienced as if that's sufficient for the future alone. How many of you are ready to embrace what it means to mature in your faith, grow in your awareness, have your relationship with God define your existence, and follow Jesus, especially during this Lenten season as we journey towards the cross? So may we focus and reflect on what the author of Hebrews is saying here, that we are being called to deepen our faith. We are being called to practice what we preach. We are being called to journey together, being challenged as to what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Are you going to demand next week another lesson in 2 plus 2? Are you going to come in expecting a new way to state that formula? Or are you going to be ready to embrace a new opportunity and experience that God brings to your attention because you have accepted the journey of maturing in Christ? It's worth it. And it's the only way. So may we embrace that this week and fully become aware of what we are celebrating and reflecting upon as we journey towards Easter. And may we always say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's pray together. God, we come before you now thankful for the way that you have enlivened us and shown us what it means to worship you. God, may the words that we have been singing continue to repeat in our minds as we leave this space here and now. May your word here in Scripture continue to come over and over again in our minds so we may reflect on what it means to mature in our faith and practice what we preach. And Lord, may you show us how to be encouraged to realize that we're doing this together, that we're all in this together, and that we are charged to proclaim this through actions and words to all people we come in contact with, so they too may be invited to journey with us towards you, Jesus, and with you. In your son's name, we always pray. Amen.